Jeannie Chaffin, and uh, I do some consulting for the National Community Action Partnership, specifically around two gen and whole families, and some other uh, items too. Uh, we're going to talk today a little bit about two gen and whole families, so I hope um, that's that's what you came for. Uh, prior to doing this consulting, I worked at HHS and did some work there around bringing different federal programs together to try to pilot two gen in rural places. And I worked at the Office of Community Services and uh, we brought CSBG to that discussion. And then I partnered with my Head Start colleagues and <coughs> colleagues and folks over at HRSA. And so when I left HHS um, and when the new administration came in, I decided to do a little bit of consulting around this issue among other things. And so while since I've been consulting with the partnership, We've had a number of learning communities that have focused on two gen and whole family. And um, I'm going to share some of that learning and experience. Maybe you've been in some other sessions this week where those agencies have, have directly uh, shared some of their learning. What we're going to talk about today is sort of an overview or a 101 on two gen and whole family. And I'll just share with you, you know, one of my interests is in this area is I think we have to do radically better than we've ever done before uh, for families and children. And so we're going to kind of start there today um, with sort of why would we um, pursue a two-gen approach or a whole family approach? What is the science behind it? What is the need behind it? You know, sometimes people just sort of are attracted to things that are the flavor of the day. Um, but we really want to uh, think about the why behind two gen and whole families. So that's what we're going to do. Um, let's uh, just for a minute. Let's think about what you want for parents and children in the future. What what would be different um, if you're sort of thinking? If you you know were closing your eyes and thinking about your vision for parents and children, <coughs> what kind of things come into mind for you? Just Throw, throw it out. What, what are you interested in? Families uh, achieving, or how would things be different? I would say empowering um, families to be advocates for their children and themselves. Empowering families to be advocates for themselves and their children? For parents to have support. Um, income support, um, social support, support to raise their kids in a way that they feel they can be honest when they have concerns or questions. They can ask those and not be penalized for that. Okay, so parents have supports, they have sufficient income, um, and they have a safe space to get what they need. Yes? They're living in decent communities where they have access to everything like others, like grocery stores. Okay, so the environment is healthy and has opportunity, food. Okay, what else? Self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency for both parents and children? Yes, sir. Okay, yes? Way out of um, low income neighborhoods where they have limited um, exposed children are exposed to a lot of crime and uh, trauma. And <coughs> so, living in good, safe neighborhoods where they have opportunity? Yes. Breaking the generational curse, the thought process of poverty is the only way that you can exist in creating a whole new shift for the breaking the cycle of poverty, and part of that is mind shift, not just income, um, but sort of other things besides just economic um, uh, influences. Sure. Any last thought? Yes. Access to quality education. Access to quality education. Okay. Think about all the things that your peers just said there, and the different sorts of, of, of ways that uh, parents and children would be different the way that families would be different. Um, do you think that we could get to that with um, providing LIHEAP to parents? No. No. Do you really think we can get to those conditions, those states that you just talked about with only doing Head Start? No. 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 Um, we have to pull things together for parents and children, right? And if you've been in community action more than a minute, <laughs> more than a minute, 
you know that you've got to work with both parents, work with both children, and bring an array of services together. And that array of services looks different for different families, right? It's, it's not a cookie cutter approach. It's to be able to, um, as a, a colleague of, of ours um, from the Ascend Institute says, you have to meet families where they dream. Um, and people's dreams are different, and people's strengths and, and, and areas for improvement are different. So our strategy needs to be built in a way that it can do that. And that's what we're going to talk about with Two Gen Whole Family today. But first off, I want to just sort of, you know, no, I don't need to convince you that uh, poverty is a problem, but I do want to sort of, you know, poverty is pretty big. <laughs> And I want to zero in a little bit on children, uh, because if we're going to, as this gentleman in the back said, uh, we have the wisdom in the very back row back there and said, break the cycle of poverty. That's what we need to do for children. So what's going on with children in America today? About 16% or 12 million children live in poverty. That's according to the supplemental poverty measure, which came up earlier this week. We had a, some, some heat uh, talking about the poverty line and the poverty measure. And, um, you know, in some ways things are simple and sometimes, you know, they're a little more complicated. Um, I'm going to show you some other numbers in a minute. You know, it makes a difference whether we're talking about the official poverty measure, the supplemental poverty measure, whether we're talking about the American Community Survey or the Community Population Survey, you know, you'll see different numbers. Um, so it's always important to sort of think about which, um, which measure we're using. That's the CPM measure, which ends up <coughs> uh, sort of having a lower number of children in poverty than the official poverty measure, but a higher number of seniors just as a little, and overall the, S, the supplemental poverty measure gives us a higher number of people in poverty but it's a, uh, than the official poverty measure, but a lot of that is because of seniors, so that's kind of interesting. So when, you, uh, excuse me, when you're talking about supplemental, that, that means that they, they include the fact that you're getting SNAP or that you're yes. getting yeah. other... Yes, yeah, they look into the benefits. Uh, they, they calculate that in, to which the official poverty measure and who uses do. those? I do, because I I kind of noticed when I went I'm, I'm from Texas and when I went up to the Capitol to talk to some of the representatives, I think that's what they were using because they, they were using numbers that I was like, uh, hold up, let me get back with you on that because yeah, they were yeah. using supplemental numbers and I was looking at the official. The official. I'm going to show you something else here in a minute that'll even make it uh, another sort of uh, a way that we should think about it. Um, our youngest children are our poorest which is important to note here in a minute when we talk about the science. 60% of poor children live in small cities, suburbs, and rural towns. That's kind of interesting. And two in three poor children in related families or families <coughs> live with an adult who works. So that came in, uh, up in our discussion earlier this week, right? That you know most people are working. Those are some basic, you can, um, you know, these are some basic numbers in the Children's Defense Fund report. And then the National Center for Children on Poverty kind of looks at things a little different. Um, and they're, they're using the supplemental poverty measure, but a, uh, a five-year average. And they sort of say, well, you know what? We shouldn't just look at folks that are at 100% of uh, the poverty line. We should look at 200%. And if you do that, you get 30 million children, or 41% of the children in America who are struggling, right? And who are influenced by poverty as, as they're growing up. And 6 million in deep poverty. So I'm gonna show you in a minute the impact of deep poverty and poverty early on children. And you say, why are you making us think about these statistics? Because when we design our two-gen approach, we need to think about how to, to get at some of this problem if we really want to have radically better outcomes than we've ever had before. 
And then, you know, if we even talk a little bit more about how poverty breaks down by race and um, the poverty that uh, children uh, of color in this country, black and Hispanic, <coughs> American Indian, are experiencing, we know that there's a big racial inequity across race. And so that also should tell us something about our two-gen whole family design when we're figuring out what might two-gen whole family look like at my community action agency. Um, that inequity is sort of regional and it's important because we are becoming a more diverse society, right? This is from the Brookings Institute and it sort of tells us the year when whites become the minority by age. So we have a lot of children of color and if they're the ones that are in poverty, what does that mean for our future? if we're not investing and tapping in and making sure we're nurturing those little Einsteins um, and, and, and folks who could you know, really be our future. Our children are our future, right? And we have a lot of children struggling, then we really have to think what we do about that. Every year we leave millions of children in poverty costs our nation $700 billion in lost, that's not in the amount of benefits, it's in lost productivity. And this is from the National Academy of Sciences that you heard from on three weeks ago. No, 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 that was like three days ago, right? Um, 700 billion in lost productivity and health and the crime costs. And then you think, and so that's an economic cost to our country. How do we compete on the global stage if we have that kind of cost, right? And not only is it an economic problem, it's a social problem too, right? And when you look at, when I was thinking about all this a couple weeks ago for this presentation and I was doing reading and I was looking at all the numbers uh, with children in poverty and the inequities by race, and then I, I bumped into somebody's uh, writing who, you know, as they're talking about these numbers, the three richest men in America hold more of our nation's wealth than the bottom half of our population. How the hell do we let that happen in this country? Somebody said yesterday we need to get angry. When I see that, I, I just, my blood boils. My blood boils. And we gotta bring that sort of outrage to this, to this work, to our design. We have to be savvy and we have to figure out what to do about that. That's Bezos, Buffett, and Gates, by the way, if you were wondering. Um, okay, so we know we have to do radically better than we've ever done before. We need to think about the need and the statistics and where there are some serious uh, issues, deep poverty, children, in, young children in poverty. And let's think about the science for a minute. Yes? Can you go back to the slide you just had, those two bullet points? <clears throat> this is kind of the problem. Yes. It, it, it is, it's, a, it's a big, big problem. Yes. I mean, this is looking at it nationally. And then you break it down to each of our community action agency boundaries. You know, if you have one of the, obviously we don't have one of those three in our boundaries. Yeah. yeah. But we have some Fortune 500 companies in our boundaries. Yes. Right? Yes. So we have some very wealthy there and some very poor there. And it looks just like that slide. Yeah. And the problem is trying to get the CCP dollars to filter down. You see mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. When we look at like any kind of funding, we look at average per capita, you know, income, you're stuck. You, you, can't, you can't get to the half of people in your community because you've got one one or two or well, a lot more than that. There's very wealthy people there, mm -hmm. and it just skews the whole thing. You can't right. really get the funding you need to help the people. Right, right. We, we, $700 billion in lost productivity. How, what, what's the CSBG level it, across the country? Does anybody know how much we get in CSBG, all of us together? Seven hundred and fourteen million. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So you know, I mean, it, we're we're losing way more every day than you know we even get. It is, and so I, we're going to talk about two gen whole family because that is um, one way to intervene with children who are suffering today who need help. But 
I think what you've heard all week is that we have to be advocates and we have to figure out if we can't raise the conversation about some of these inequities, who, who will in some of the places in America? We have to be leaders on this. Um, this has gotten out of hand. Um, and you know, it's just kept moving in the wrong direction. Um, and I, at the risk of being political, I should probably move on. Uh, <laughs> I'll be in trouble with the partnership. Uh, okay, so um, the science and the lessons from the field. I guess one last thing I would say about there's part of why I put economic and social challenges there is because even from an economic perspective, for the employers in your community who some of the top people, if we don't invest in those children, and children of color, they're, they're going to have trouble being thriving businesses, right? Because we cannot let people sit on the sidelines and expect that this country is going to make it, right? And that's what we're doing with too many children, is they're really being forced to the sidelines. So we have to disrupt that. And 2Gen is one way, but it's not the only way. Um, so, you know, I, I want to make sure folks know that. So, so here's some of the science behind child poverty. So you know the numbers and then some of the science about what happens. And this is also from the National Academy report that you heard from the other morning. And they are confirming um, that especially when poverty incur occurs in early childhood or persists throughout a large portion of childhood, there are really negative outcomes for children and then negative outcomes as they move into their adulthood. So we're hearing right there, if it is um, when they're really young, that's a problem, right? Child poverty is really a problem. Uh, children growing up in poverty fare much worse than other children. Children living in deep poverty have the worst outcomes. That's like 50, below 50% 50 of the poverty line, right? That's deep poverty. Yes? Question, it's sort of a fundamental question. Um, I know we're going to talk about uh, two gen. Yes. But one of the things I think about all the time when I hear the word child poverty is the fact that a child is poor because his or her parents are yes. poor. Yes, yes. And so, with if we take care of adult poverty, do we not at the same time take care of child, child yeah, poverty? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Stay with me for just a minute more, because you <coughs> are you're you are right on the perfect track. You're absolutely doing the thinking that you should be doing. We've got to consider the importance of limiting the amount of time a child spends in poverty, especially in the early years. And here is why. And this is exactly what you're saying. So the negative, good child outcomes or negative child outcomes are going to be influenced by the parent's investment pathway. And investment really is about income. So the amount of income in the household um, is going to have uh, either a negative or a positive effect, depending on if it's a sufficient income. If it's an insufficient income, let's say, then there's also a stress pathway that creates trauma and you, you know the adverse childhood experiences that you've probably heard about um, material hardship in a home and if you've ever taken LIHEAP applications or if you've been in Head Start you've seen what happens <coughs> in a family when there's material hardship right that is a negative investment pathway it creates negative stress and trauma in the family and it can have negative child outcomes and and eventually um, out, negative outcomes as a, in adulthood. So we, so this is sort of saying a child doesn't have income. <laughs> we're not paying a child. We've got to, if we're going to address child poverty, we have to think about the parents, right? And so that is the basis for a two-gen whole family approach. Does that apply to the the community as a whole too? Like if, if we're like from a poor community, there there's no good healthcare facilities. Yes. You gotta go out of town and there's yes. no good education. Right. No good so that stress pathway is also about the environment. So you're bringing up that the environment can cause stress and I think uh, you mentioned that in the back there that if there's crime, if it's not safe, those also can create trauma. It's not just what's happening in the family, 
but the environment creates trauma and stress too, right? So that's why we can never sort of think about two gen in a silo of a service delivery approach. We always have to think about what's going on in the community too. Um, that's nice. Uh, so, so we've got we've got that. Um, that income investment pathway has to do with you know is there enough health care is there enough food is there enough housing is there enough uh, education so when those things uh, I started my career in Darla's in the agency Darla works at in uh, Springfield Missouri and I took light heap applications all day there's no better way to understand what's happening with families than to take light heap applications all day and one thing you really get to understand is the stress of not being able to do these things for children. What that kind of stress that puts on the family, right? That's sort of what we're talking about. Or um, the environment, like we said. It is, there can be um, envir uh, environmental stressors uh, that create an issue. So what we have to do, the reason that folks have been uh, talking so much about two gen and whole family is it goes right at the heart of this problem that we've just looked at. Child poverty and the idea that you know young children or children living in deep poverty is going to have negative outcomes. So what do we do? Well, the Harvard Center for the Developing Child says we need to reduce the sources of stress so that may mean that we need to increase mom and dad's income so that material hardship isn't there. Uh, we need to strengthen core life skills, coping skills perhaps, um, and support responsive relationships because those of you who are sort of experts in ACEs probably know that so a lot of people may have some ACEs and it may not have a negative impact. None of this is predetermined, right? We don't ever want to think, well, just because these things exist, there's going to be some, some bad problems. A lot of it has to do with what kind of buffers or protective factors there are in the family. And so supportive, responsive relationships can help buffer some of that trauma and some of those adverse experiences. And those of you in the Head Start world could probably teach on that much better than I can. Um, but that's part of what we have to intervene in. The other thing I want you to think about as you come into a thinking about two gen whole family in your agency is young people are the workers of, of, of today and tomorrow, right? Young adults, 18 to 24. How hard is it to go from young adolescent teenage and transition into young adulthood? It's hard for all of us, right? If you're sort of in poverty or you've had um, some struggles, that can be even harder. And if you happen to be a young parent, just you know, think about those challenges. And young people who become parents in their teenage years and early 20s really you know, have a difficult time navigating, and that perpetuates the cycle of poverty. So we need to think about young parents, especially when we're thinking about our two-gen whole family. And also because there's new evidence, new science that tells us that the brain development is actually happening till maybe 24, 25, 26 years. So you may have a young parent who you know, has, has children and their brain is still developing and even they're learning that when a new mom or a new dad brings that baby home, there are things happening in their brain you know, that, that create opportunities. Um, and it gets worse if you have a high rate of uh, teen pregnancy, like in my community, so teen pregnancy is a, a big problem. Yes, yeah. They nationally, teen, kids, the great news on that is nationally teen pregnancy dropping. has been dropping. But in certain communities, it could be higher, yes. I've seen a lot of it related to um, illiterate parents. <coughs> 
like I want to be able to read to my baby and so yes. we talk them through how reading isn't just reading words yeah but also the opportunity to gain those literacy skills so that you can yes. read to your child as they age yes. and kind of learn with them yeah that enriching enhancing environment is so important so so this is what I was just saying about new new developments and there's a whole article at Ascend and if you haven't nerded out on the Ascend website, I would definitely encourage you to do that. The, there's more articles than you could ever, you know, read. Divide those up amongst your team, and you know, get really, really deep and smart on some of this stuff. But, but there's a, a great art, article on the neurobiology uh, of brains and young parents, and this is sort of also a reference. And we'll put this in the app. It's not in the app today, but I promise it'll get in there. Um, not today, but by next Tuesday, um, it'll be in there for you. But this is this is also on that. So this is my very elementary. Um, the partnership staff would die probably if they saw this slide. Um, so don't don't show it to Denise. Um, it, I'm really interested in that intersection. So we have adults who are maybe parents, 18 to 24, and they have young children that are under five. Think how much potential there is for us to have a robust strategy that could break the cycle of poverty for those folks. The science, basically, what, what's happening to, is, I think the science really points us. Not that we shouldn't serve other folks, and, and you know, I could do a whole nother, be just as passionate tomorrow in a session about seniors and the potential looming senior poverty problem that's coming down the road. So don't get me wrong, I don't, you know, there are other things we have to think about, but I think this is, when we're try, trying to talk about breaking the cycle of poverty, I think this really does say something to us. So that's, you know, i t taken our precious time here, uh, we don't have a lot of time together, because I want you to have that foundation. I don't want you to launch into your two-gen whole family, um, designing and, and pursuing this at your agency unless you really think about some of these uh, demographics and some of the science behind it, okay? Because that should influence your decisions about what your two-gen approach might look like. So let's talk very specifically about two-gen whole family. Um, there's a great video, and it's at the Harvard Center for the Developing Child. We're not going to watch it today, but I highly recommend this video, and, and we'll make sure there's a link there so that you can, you can watch that when you get the uh, slide deck. So this, I'm going to, you know, I hopefully won't step on anybody's toes. No, no. <laughs> um, I, because I, I want to be clear about something, and you should already see it in some of what, I, what I've said. A two-gen approach serves parents and children together. You all said Head Start wouldn't be enough to break the cycle of poverty, right? But yet sometimes we think, well, we're already doing two-gen when we're doing Head Start. We're doing some of it, but what you have to have when you have a really solid two-gen approach is your child component has to be deep and intentional and high quality. And your parent component has to be deep and intentional and high quality, sort of equally. And, and when we're being true to ourselves, I love Head Start. I love Head Start. The child component is the gold standard, right? Head Start early, Head Start, it's the gold standard for early childhood. You can't get any better. If you have a high quality Head Start program, you are going to help with that child developmentally, no doubt. There is a parent engagement component, right? But it is not as intense or as rich or as deep as the child component. The parent component in Head Start doesn't necessarily look at changing the parent's investment pathway or income or work. It, it can be a component, the case management uh, the coaching that some parents get in Head Start has value but we need to bring other supports along aside that. I like to think about it as stacking, stacking things on top maybe of Head Start parent component and wrapping stuff around the Head Start parent component to get both things equally as intensive and rich, right? Does that make sense? Good, good. 
Okay. Um, so what are some other characteristics of two gen whole family? It's this, this isn't a checklist. I mean, some of the beauty of this is that it can be designed around what your parents need and it better damn well be designed around what your parents need and in your community, parents are probably and children are going to need different things. But you can think about <coughs> family goals being shared across programs. So it's not about us having multiple goals for the kids and the parents and the family across, their, you know, in this program and that when we have shared goals for the parents and, and, the, and the children. Goals include outcomes for children, parents, and family. You can probably think of some of your programs that you have right now that serve parents that are probably training programs that address income, train parents, but you don't have any child outcomes for that family or vice versa. But in 2Gen, we've got to have outcomes for both parents and children, and I'll show you some examples of those in a minute from your peers. Aligning, coordinating, integrating a suite of services, making access easier, and I, I said high quality intensive. It's important to think about where we're going, and you guys sort of gave me a tiny bit of that in the beginning, and that's, that's, that's our ends, right? That's where we want to go. 2Gen is a strategy or a tactic um, to get us there. So we, wanna, we don't want to confuse, okay, we're just doing 2Gen, and that's a good thing, versus where we're trying to go. So we always sort of want to think about that a little bit. And um, just a word about service integration in 2Gen. Um, <coughs> I said coordinate, align a suite of services, that that's sort of a characteristic. Well, you can do that for a lot of populations other than parents and children, right? I bet some of you have prisoner reentry programs. Who has a prisoner reentry program? Anybody? A couple of you. And you integrate services for them, right? So there's a lot of service integration done in community action. Service integration itself <coughs> is not 2Gen. It's just a piece. It's a piece of 2Gen. Just like you may be integrating, integrating for seniors or veterans. So sometimes we get really caught up in service integration when we're working on our 2Gen stuff and we forget that it's not just service integration, but it's providing those intensive services like we talked about uh, a minute ago. So here's what I've seen now in you know working pretty intensively with probably <coughs> 40, 50, or more community action agencies that are really trying to shift to a whole family approach. And also, you know, reviewing uh, more literature than, you know, most people uh, would be interested in doing is. You first, think, you can sort of think about this as a readiness, a very high level readiness check. If you don't have high quality services for both parents and children, then that's your first step is let's build some high quality services for parents. You know, in some uh, community action agencies that might be, they're training some parents to have health, to take on health occupations so that they can have a family supporting wage. Or they're training some of their parents in early childhood and getting their associate's degree so that you're changing the income. You don't have to take the kid out of the family, you're increasing the family's income. You've got to have high quality services for the parent and the child. If you have mediocre services, you need to fix that problem first. Because you're not going to get better outcomes than you've ever gotten with mediocre services, right? So you have high quality. Then you've got to integrate those. Like I said, integration is a piece. So how do we integrate? How do we make our services more accessible, more streamlined? Do we case coordinate on shared families across our programs? You know, what do we do? Do we have um, uh, coordinated coaching across the agency? What's common uh, intake, no wrong door, whatever it takes to be integrated. And then we can sort of think about saying we have a two-gen approach, a two-gen strategy, or a two-gen organization. And those are different things. And if you talk to some of your peers who've been on this journey a while, they're sort of really getting to you know, a mindset change, coordinating, 
and providing services simultaneously. So they're moving through all of these kind of stages. One thing I should probably say um, about, you know, you've probably heard me say two gen and then sometimes say whole family. And you might say, Jeannie, what's the difference? Okay. Um, two gen is two generation has sort of ascend that we were looking at, um, and this is their guiding pr principles, started sort of in this two gen 2.0 period that we're in using that phrase. And it really focused in on parents and children. Although they will say to you, because some of you might be thinking about grandparents, um, there are a lots of ways that families look today, right? And families always define themselves. So when we say two gen, that doesn't mean this only works for a parent and child. It's really caretaker and child. You know, that might be a grandparent, it might be a foster parent, it might be an auntie or an uncle. Um, but it's the, the significant caretaker in that, that, in that child's too. So, and, and it's that way because of the science, right? Like who matters, who, who is driving the environment that that child lives in. Now, we started using whole family a, a, a little a bit, uh, maybe four or five years ago, um, for a political reason, which I'm not going to mention today. And um, uh, sort of to convey that, you know, the, it is the whole family. It's not just the parent and that Head Start child. There may be teen uh, children there. There may be other family members living in that, uh, you know, um, who all, may or may not be related in some ways to, to the, and we wanted to think about the whole family, right? And I also think that the whole family is a little bit more of a community action friendly way of thinking about this in some ways because we generally, you know, are sort of kind of looking at the whole family a lot, a lot of times. And we have multiple services so we can think about bringing those to the whole family. So um, people have different opinions about, you know, what those two terms mean. But, but we sort of um, are encompassing kind of both of those kinds of, of, of uh, thoughts around it. Um, measure and account for outcomes for both the children and a parent. That these are sort of the two gen guiding principles from Ascend. Engage and listen to family voices. So there is a real ethic and value and principle in the two gen work that's been going on today is that we're co-designing alongside with families and not designing for families. And I would tell you that the best two gen programs that are developing are, are ones that really deeply, deeply listen to families and what they want. Um, a project that I've been involved with in Maine spent really a year um, talking to families about what it might take to help them go to community college and now they're like in their fourth year of a program where they're helping young moms uh, get college credit and they have like a 95% retention rate. I don't think that is um, surprising based on the learning. Your colleague, Connie Stottlemyre <coughs> and her team, I think they were presenting on the first day of the conference on deep, deep listening that they did in Topeka in order to design their integrated two-gen approach. I think they're gonna go farther They've been a little bit more slower than some agencies, but once they figure out where they're going, I think they'll get farther than a lot of other agencies because they will have been very um, methodical. Uh, my, my friend Charles McCann says, haste makes waste. And if you're hasty and you just throw a program together and you don't talk and listen and design along families, you'll, you'll regret that later. And remember, we're community action, so we're supposed to be listening to families, and that's not just an org standard to check off the box. That is, who, that is supposed to be in our DNA. Ensure equity, you know, I showed you the inequity of, of children of color in poverty. That is structural and institutional, and we have to figure out all the things that we do that might be able to, that may be furthering that, or that we can design our programs in a way where they don't, um, you know, further any uh, inequities. Evidence-based, innovation, and then aligning systems. So, 
This is a, an ascend continuum that they use to kind of help you think about, you know, the whole family, serving the whole family. You may have programs that are parent focused with child elements, child focused with parents, but how do they how do they bring this together? And so you could sort of think about, you know, a little, nice little um, lunch session at your agency, have folks come to the table and think about all our <coughs> programs and where do they fit on this continuum and just do a little readiness assessment of, of how you're doing. The other thing that um, it's important to think about is this, this sort of the theory of change um, for 2Gen. So, Basically what we're saying with 2Gen is that if you have families, if you have parents and children, and you align these kinds of interventions and strategies for them, and I'm going to go over these more in depth in a minute, then the ability for them to thrive and be healthy and break the cycle of <coughs> poverty is increased. So we're really doing this to break the cycle of poverty. If we're going to break the cycle of poverty for parents and children, we're going to have to ramp up the parents' income, we're going to have to have good early childhood development so that child's outcomes are, 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 are um, better later. So let me just say one more thing about 2Gen and then we'll, we'll just stop and talk for a minute. So no family Families come with strengths and, and, and challenges, right? We've always in community action operated from a strengths-based perspective with our families, right? Um, we, it's not all about all the needs that families have. And families have strengths in all these areas and families have needs. And if I have a young mom who maybe dropped out uh, of school and needs her GED and she's a young, young child in, um, in Head Start, we need to work about, we need to work on her trajectory, right? So that may be post-secondary or an employment pathway. Um, she may be fine in the health and well-being area. She may not need mental health or, um, you know, there may not be any toxic stress there. Or maybe there is, or maybe somebody else that comes is going to need that. Um, maybe some folks need some housing support, some financial capabilities, some transportation. And then what they call the secret sauce of 2Gen is social capital. So that is about, so if you tuned in to John Powell's conversation earlier in the week, remember when um, John talked about bridging and breaking capital? And there's bonding capital. So bonding is sort of, you know, maybe um, my bonds and my family, my aunt, my uncle, uh, in my sort of sphere. Bridging is sort of outside, maybe to my neighbors or to others in my community, to my, uh, my coach. Um, that, that's bridging. And people need both. People need all of that social capital and support. You have those, probably, a big, rich array of uh, bridging and bonding capital that helps you when you screw up and lock yourself out of the house or you're, you, know, you have car trouble or whatever. Uh, bridging and, and bonding capital, it's the secret sauce. And, and, and being in a community where you feel safe and, and you belong is also part of that. So, so in addition to being high quality, intentional, integrated, stacking and wrapping around services for parents and child, we need to be attentive to this sort of mix of services. Not that we'll give every one of these to every parent who comes in, but we need to be fluid or light on our feet and be able to respond. Now, do you need to be able to provide every one of these things? No, but wherever you are not um, able, you need to have a partnership or a way, right? A phone number. Or a phone number, right, right, right. Multiple phone numbers, right. So let me just take a breath there and sort of ask for your reactions or, you know, what's noodling around in your head so far? But just to add a little bit to what, what you were talking about is um, the clip effect. Yes. Is, is obviously, I mean, it's just within all of the right. kinds of right. within the nation for eligibility requirements. Yes. We have so many parents or single parent or both parents that are getting on 
their feet. The child's receiving these high quality services and they're just about there and then, oh, well, now you're making a dollar too much. So we're going to pull this from you yeah. and it may be seen yes. for a tougher assistant. Yes. Well, they, they take five steps back and then they pull the next thing right. pretty soon right. they're at ground zero. Right. Right. I think that, uh, I hope that if they are able to pass a TANF uh, reform bill that, you know, some of this gets, the thing is that it's not just TANF, it's also child care and food stamps and housing and, you know, a number of things. So that's, that's part of the problem. Mary Beth? Can I just add into that that with TANF, that because there's a block grant that the state office, you know, state offices have a lot of authority. So number one with TANF, please be watching your legislatures. There state are legislatures. state yeah. legislatures. Um, Stop the scam is a really big piece of legislation that has hit a lot of state offices um, or state legislatures that um, is really fundamentally changing TANF. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Some states now have even more restrictive uh, rules around TANF that are really impacting our families. But TANF can do great things like allow for um, extended eligibility. You're allowed to write that into your state plan. You're allowed <coughs> to give um, bonuses, or, or they call them bonuses, or rewards for getting employment. States are allowed to do that. So please be sure that you're engaged and watching because you know the state has a lot of authority and leeway. Yeah. And we need to have a voice at that team. Yes, yeah, I love that, Mary Beth. And Mary Beth worked in Kentucky and had influence in that space. So if you want to know more about what you should be looking at, talk, talk to Mary Beth, um, and who works at NASCAST, but I'm sure we'd be happy to talk more about this. The other thing I will say on a positive side, so that, you know, uh, didn't get around the country that I was beating up on TANF completely, um, um, there, are TAN, there are state TANF agencies who are funding two-gen whole family. There are quite a number. Who, anybody in here from Virginia? Maine, Virginia. Virginia just passed the, the state legislature. This is another um, point to that make that Mary Beth is sort of suggesting. Um, the Virginia state legislature just passed using 1.2 million of their TANF money to fund a two-gen pilot in Virginia. Five <coughs> community action agencies will get money um, to. Um, pilot to gen work and it's funded by TANF. The main project that I mentioned to you is they has a lot of TANF money um, that the state of Maine has put in. Many of your states have unspent TANF money and you can go on the ACF Office of Family Assistance website and look to see how much unspent TANF money your state has. If your state has a lot of unspent TANF money, I would be going to the commissioner and having a conversation about that if I lived in the community action world in a state like that. And some of you have lobbyists at the association. You should talk to your lobbyists about what's going on with TANF, what can we do, how can we make the rules more flexible. In addition to TANF, some of the cliff effect stuff can be really influenced in your child development block grant and some of the rules that are made about that. And there was a huge amount of money over, what was it, two years ago? That went into the block grant, um, the, the child care block grant that gave states a lot of opportunity to include, increase eligibility, even out the off ramp, which would do some things about the cliff effect. You can also weigh in on that state plan. And if your state association lobbyist isn't talking, to the state about what's going on with child care, because that's where the cliff effect really hurts young moms, and, right? Mm -hmm. Is when all of a sudden their child, they got a raise in their child care. Yes? What was that? Office of Family Assistance uh, at the Administration for Children and Families. That's where the TANF, there's a data report, and it'll say state pie charts. And you can go on there and look at unobligated is the column you want to look at. If there's uh, zero dollars in unobligated, then you're out of luck. But if there's 50 million, um, then maybe. Yeah, can I say something? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Y'all keep talking about like the Head Start program and this mm -hmm. and that, but really it needs to start like at child care. Like uh, I was looking at statistics in my in my community and. Uh, 
we don't have a child care in our community because it's so small. You know, we're a population of under under 2,000. We don't have a, a child care. Mm -hmm. But I know for a fact from reading that if we had a child care, oh, oh. Texas, okay. <laughs> uh, if we had a child care, uh, the, the, uh, when, when these kids go into school, they'd be more prepared to go into school. I'm looking at statistics and like 40% like of my population is not prepared to go into first grade. Yeah. And I know it starts at childcare, you know, right. parents are leaving, and especially if you're uh, Hispanic, or probably not only just because you're Hispanic, yeah. but you know, you leave your kids at grandma's house, grandma yes. don't speak English. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Uh, there needs to be right. something. Right, so the, we know zero to five is really important. Yeah. And Head Start isn't the only way to get at that. Um, there's home visiting. Um, some Head Starts will um, do a partnership with uh, home providers. So maybe you don't have a center, but even if there's home providers, <coughs> the home, a lot of times the home providers are the same ones that don't speak English. Yeah, but what they might be able to do is but you might be able to foster yeah. some partnerships between some of those home providers and your Head Start. Um, so there are different ways to get at it. I, it's, yeah. it's tough in mm -hmm. rural places, I understand, but there are some possibilities. And maybe some of the other wisdom in the group might have some other ideas for folks. I'm going to go here and then here. Um, can you, can you um, ask you to put back up the, the theory of change slide? Yeah, yeah. And I want to tell a story um, that actually deals with um, child care. Okay. Uh, about, um, in Rochester, New York, about a month and a half ago, a uh, young lady working at Tim Hortons, um, she had to take her son to work because she couldn't find anybody to take care of him. She didn't have the money for child care. Young child, I guess. Yes. Okay. Um, he was three years old. Okay. He died. How did he die? Um, while she was working, he walked away. He fell, he fell into a grease trap. Oh, oh gosh. Devastating stuff. Oh, oh gosh. Within three weeks, they've passed legislators for, for, for um, covering the grease traps properly. So we raised the house and like, no, upstream. Upstream, right? Right, so yeah. when we talk about that theory of change, yeah. you know, and the social network that she didn't have, yes. or the adequate child care, right, the fact right. that she had to take him to work, that's yes. the problem. Yes. Not the fact that the grease trap wasn't covered properly. I mean, yes, you need to cover yeah. the yes, grease trap. Yes, 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 yes. But the kid died. They missed the whole point. Yes. Yeah. The kid yeah. died. Yeah. You know, so yeah. this is where I think our collective voice <coughs> yes. is really, really important. Yes. Yes. Beautiful little boy. You know, and now her, oh. talking about trauma for her, right. yeah. you know, that yeah. she'll never forgive herself, I'm no. sure. No. But that, she didn't have, right. you know, she like he mentioned, grandma. Yeah. Her social networking said, yeah. can you hold a little whatever yeah. for four hours while I go do this shit? Yes. Yes. That means that. <coughs> yes. Yes. That's the real right. thing. That and I thing. so appreciate you, you know, although it hurts to hear that, Devastate. to bringing it up because I, one of my biggest fears, so I'm an upstreamist yeah. completely. It's partly what attracts me to this yeah. is because I want to go upstream yeah. and figure out how we get kids. I want the shortest spell possible for a child so that that suffering and that damage is, is not there. So, so I'm an upstreamist. But I also know that what you're saying about the rules and the power and what we want to invest in, that's all that community level stuff has got to be dealt with. And so I think you know, if I were the executive director of an agency, I would be doing two gen, and then I would have a collective impact program uh, initiative running right alongside my two gen to get everybody in the community wrapping around parents and children. And what do we need to do to raise wages? What do we need to do to make places safe? Whatever in our community is sort of the system or institutional problem that parents are facing, we're also addressing. So I think the beauty of community action is you do a both, you should be, you can do a both and. We're addressing individuals, but we're also improving conditions in the community. And sometimes I worry that all my all this talk about two gen is going to steer people away from thinking about the community and the systems. But it's got to be both things. Austin, the city of Austin, which you know is an urban area, of course, but they have a plan, a two gen plan across the whole city. 
So they sort of say, how do we support and protect and change conditions so that all of our kids and our parents thrive? That's like ideal, I think. So um, there's also a commitment to thinking about that. Uh, Liz, I think you had something? Yes, you mentioned earlier about um, the Head Start program having a family engagement component uh -huh. that doesn't address all the needs of the family. Mm -hmm. Can you expound on that a little bit more? Yeah, and my Head Start colleagues, please, you know, give, give us your thoughts of, about this too. But I think, it, you know, parent engagement is, a, um, is an important component of Head Start. And if you go back, which oh yes, hear I'm right sorry, now. I'm sorry. She asked if I could go, that I made a comment about Head Start and parent engagement and maybe it wasn't uh, the whole family or it wasn't intensive enough and she asked me to come back and talk about that. Um, so when I think about the, um, you know, I, folks have different, what do you, you call your folks family advocates that or um, Family, family, family navigators. We have our family coaches. You have all, you have all family yeah. coaches. So people call their casework that they do for parents and Head Start. You know, there's different titles and different terms, but those caseloads are usually pretty high, right? You may, if you're a large program, you may have what 50 or 100. You know, and so that casework can't be real um, intensive. And on top of it, you know, mom can have a goal, or dad, and your family advocate may be helping on you, but, but really, mom needs more than just sort of the coaching or the case management. She may need uh, job training. She may need support going to school. Um, for example, there's a, 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 a program, in, not a program, but an agency in Virginia that takes their Head Start moms, and, and they get you know, case management coaching, but they are also offered an opportunity to um, enroll in a health professional training program, and they get certification, and then by the time they get that done, they're out, and they're on a pathway to a family supporting wage. So it's that more intensive service, I think we have to bring a head start for the parent. That was really what I was saying. As it relates to the whole family, you know, I think probably different um, head start programs approach this differently. Some of you may really have an ethic that your Head Start family advocates, you know, try to make as many referrals for everybody in the family as they can, not just the four-year-old, but if they're older siblings, um, maybe some Head Start programs don't do that. So there's probably variance. And, you know, I sort of focus on Head Start because that's all, also often a common way that I think community action can get in because you may have Head Start and you may have JTPA and so pulling it together. But I don't, if you don't have Head Start, I think there are many other ways to get into two gen whole family. There's home visiting. Um, you can partner with your local Head Start. Maybe you have employment and training and housing and many other things that if you would partner with your local Head Start, you could you know get some of these key families that we're talking about. So. Um, that was sort of what I was thinking. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other comments or questions? Yes. So Sue, let me just say, Sue is uh, in from Maine, and their agency has been on a journey to really think about building um, and integrating services for parents and children. So speak up, Sue, so they can hear you in the back. Sure. So I am the director for the Early Care and Education Programs and part of the service delivery um, team at my agency. And when we started on this journey, many of our Head Start um, staff said, the, asked the very question, why do we need to do anything different? Because we're Head Start and we've always been doing this work with families. And what we really looked at was exactly what you said. Um, parent family engagement has been um, a, an opportunity for families to attend parent meetings, to ask for resources, um, to be given phone numbers to make calls. The family dynamics have changed a lot over the last 10 or more years um, to the point where we have families that may not be able to do that on their own. And what we um, have implemented is a family coaching model where our family coaches meet with every Head Start family who's coming into the program and they start the family assessment process 
and then they offer coaching. And we have, um, each coach is limited to a caseload of 20 families um, that That's can it. be in intensive coaching. And what that means is that those families have identified that they, they themselves have identified that they need more. Mm -hmm. And um, so coaches are actually in their homes on a weekly basis. They take them to um, recovery centers. They um, attend meetings with them. They may, they may transport them and their children mm -hmm. to doctor's appointments. Um, but they're really helping those families to make connections in the community and um, education is another one. We've, we've had such success with um, families really uh, we've uh, had more than a 50 percent increase in bachelor degrees associate degrees and parents obtaining certification and licenses over the last three years that's great so it works any other thoughts or questions or comments so far yes what uh, consulting is available to cap agencies interested in integrating this model and looking at other logic models yeah. of yeah. actual agencies that are actually yep. doing this work. Yep, yep. Yes. Um, we've developed, uh, the partnership's developed a lot of resources over the last couple years, and I'm going to show you before we get done where some of those resources are online. Um, but you can also contact a partnership um, and um, Tiffany Marley at the partnership and let her know you're in, you know, you'd like to soak up some more and talk to her about what your needs are and, and they'll see what they can do. It might be that you might be in a state where we're planning some training or, um, you know, depend, you know, there are a lot of different things going on. So likely there's something we can do or we can put you in touch with another agency that's close by that you could go. One of the great things I think that if you want to do this is to go on a site visit to an agency that's been doing this for a couple years there's nothing like seeing it, right, and being able to ask, ask people, you know, what were your problems, how did you work through them. Not that you'll go back and do it exactly the same way, but, you know, it, it really speeds up and expedites your learning. So we, there are lots of different things we can do, um, and, and we've got some other tools I'll show you. We're, we're doing really good on time, so we'll be able to look at some of those tools. Um, so, oh my gosh, here's some examples of some places that are uh, sort of leading the way in community action. So, <coughs> CAP Tulsa Community Action uh, Project in Tulsa, Oklahoma, was really the pioneering agency in the whole country to develop this 2Gen 2.0. We think about Head Start as being 2Gen 1.0 in many ways, but this is 2Gen 2.0. And they are sort of a unique uh, community action agency. They focus a lot on Head Start and economic security for the parents in Head Start. They have a health professions opportunity grant, and they put and a lot of their Head Start parents go into that HPOG program. They have a partnership with an actual mental health institution that does their coaching and case management. So. The folks uh, are getting like very high quality coaching from very uh, skilled trained folks. A good thing to know about them is they're in a random control trial right now. It's like a three or four year. And they uh, have the initial results. It's not the final results, but like the first wave of results from their um, um, RCT on their website. So you can go and look on their resources and read about what the um, Northwestern University is saying about their, their program. And it looks very, you know, people often ask me, well, is this evidence-based? And I would say it's evidence-informed at this and science-informed at this uh, point. We don't have random controlled trials to prove it all out, but as I, what we're trying to do is bring the science and the evidence that we do have to um, the discussion. But they do have some initial results. One really awesome thing that I think we're starting to see in some of our community of practice agencies is that the parents who are sort of in the two-gen approach, who are getting this more intensive, high-quality support, those kids' attendance and Head Start is way better. 
And those of you in Head Start know, attendance matters, right? If they're not in class, we're not going to be getting them ready for kindergarten. So that is, if, if the parent is getting educated and the child is in class and attendance, they're going to get that early childhood. That is a very good initial sign that things are going well. Yes? I just have a question about the model, uh, just so that I understand. Um, does the model uh, partner with employers and different things so that um, when they're finished with whatever certifications they're taking, yeah. they're able to get employment? Yeah. Uh, read a lot about they a lot of stuff has been published about them I'm pretty certain they do work on placement and you know they're they're following these families you know for a pretty extensive number of years to you know make sure they really do um, you know get out uh, get uh, to economic security so I think you know the the job after training is certainly a component I will tell you the interesting thing about CAP Tulsa is, you know, probably about 20 years ago, they were into, got on a strategic planning process and sort of landed on, we want to break the cycle of poverty. And some people might have said, well, that could be a 20-year process, right? Well, we're 20 years later. And so, you know, if they had never started, they would have never started moving families. And so I, I think they're a good example. And Garrett County, um, Maryland, the next one is also an example. Of these folks, these two agencies that were really some of our pioneers, it was emerging from the agency saying, we want better <coughs> results. We are not satisfied. It, yes, we are doing good work, and we're helping some, but we have to help more. And we've got to rethink our strategy. And if you are really going to make this shift, it's got to be at sort of that agency strategic planning theory of change thinking. It's all hands on deck across the organization. That's a whole nother session, um, but it, it, you know, it really is important. So I mentioned rural impact. The, um, uh, when, when I was serving in the Obama administration, Secretary Vilsack, are there any Iowans in the room? Gosh, I love him. He's the most, uh, he, he led the US Department of of agriculture in the Obama administration. He was uh, a foster care kid himself. Uh, your governor at one time, right? Um, he went to President Obama and said, I want to do something about child poverty in the last couple years of our administration. And President Obama, of course, said, go for it. And so we ended up with a little pilot project called Rural Impact. There were six community action agencies in that. Uh, Mid-Iowa community action uh, was a part of that. And we were really trying to test, you know, how do you do two gen in very rural, 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 rural places like, uh, like you mentioned. So there's a lot of learning there. The whole family approach, community of practice is 10 CAAs. ACAP is one um, that uh, is funded by Annie E. Casey to shift to a whole family approach. Uh, and so there's a great learning there across a number of states. We've had a whole family learning community group um, last year that was 16 CAAs. These are all different agencies. And then five uh, community action agencies um, that are doing implementing innovative practices. And I think almost all five of those are working on 2Gen. So here, anybody in, from Central Missouri in the room this morning? Okay. Central Missouri Community Action is one of our uh, community of practice agencies. and. Um, this is their theory of change, that social mobility and thriving communities comes from economic stability, social connections, and family well-being. And then they sort of have mapped out what those are. They are, a bit, have their uh, whole family is built on uh, Head Start, 
but then they cross-trained their Section A, their CSBG, their, um, I, I don't know how many different program staff in a coaching model that's trauma-informed, ACEs-informed, and the families in Head Start are getting that coaching and um, so very similar to you know, what you all are doing. And the idea is that that intensive support for those parents while the kids are in Head Start you know, will move people out. So they're doing some great work. They're also, they have a bridge program where they're in the Head Start, uh, the schools that, that Head Start feeds into, the elementary schools, they're carrying on some of that coaching into, uh, for the kids and the parents as they go into <coughs> kindergarten, first grade, and second grade. So what we haven't talked about is that sometimes this takes time, right? And if you get a family when the kid is four years old, one year of, you know, of being in Head Start and working with mom may not be enough. So we have to figure out how to extend the time. This also becomes an eligibility issue. If your state makes you redetermine eligibility for CSBG every year, and people get above 125, you know, what's the policy? You know, how are you going to serve mom till maybe she gets 200%? So that's also a conversation for a second, uh, 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 com uh, second webinar. Um, okay, this isn't a community action, but I think so highly of this work, and, and we, we, there's lots of good work that happens outside community action. Sometimes we don't act like that happens, but it does. <laughs> Brighton Center in Newport, <coughs> Kentucky. Um, they are a multi-service center. They, if, you would, if you didn't know, they look like a community action agency if you just saw them. Um, they're, they're, do you know them, Mary Beth? Yeah, they're, they're I'm pretty sure one of the TANF, you know, they do some of the TANF work in Kentucky as well. Talk yeah. about bringing together all of the services. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do a lot of service integration. But they have been, they are sort of an example for me of how getting very, very intentional about what they want for families. And you can almost go talk to anybody in this agency, and they have hundreds of staff, and they will very, very clearly be able to articulate um, their mission and their vision and all the components that need to go into it. And they've developed this sort of, you know, in some ways it's their theory of change, and they're just, so intentional about helping all their families walk through this process of if they're down, you know, here at the beginning, there's, you know, stabilizing, building supports, helping people live day to day, build financial assets, give back. And they have a white paper that is on, on coaching and their values and everybody in that agency is very clear about the value of coaching to get families out of poverty. So it's just, it, it's a good example of um, trying to deal with some of the organizational work that needs to happen to be able to do this. Looky there, Sue. Oh, that looks familiar. <laughs> so uh, this is Sue's agency's logic model, and I have it up here um, to sort of show you that you know, they do have outcomes for parents, outcomes for the child, and outcomes, for, or here are their outcomes for the family, short term. Uh, they have, of course, outputs, activities, um, but they really are doing that for both parents, children, and family. And they thought this out, they, they have what's called a family council that has worked on this together. And have, again, they are getting very intentional about what they're trying to do. Would you want to say anything about your lodging model? Um, I, I would like to say something about our family council. Okay. I think that Great. has been a really key component of our, our Speak trans up so they can hear you in the back. I think that, that our family council has been a key component of our transformation. We brought together members from each um, corner of our agency. So there are, there's membership from Head Start, from Coaching, from HEAP, from um, our prevention, health prevention programs, from our recovery center. Um, and we all come together and meet at least once a month. Um, we, the, the Family Council um, has been the community of practice group for the most part, um, developing the logic model and the theory of change, and then um, taking responsibility to train 
and to um, inform the rest of the agency on what the transformation looks like to coaching and whole family. And we've done that together as a group. So I may go to a HEAP staff meeting um, with uh, representatives from prevention services and, and recovery, our recovery center, to work with the HEAP staff around what coaching means and what's our next step in the process. So they're really seeing silos breaking down. And we were a very siloed agency, and we knew we needed to get away from that. So um, by coming together, the Family Council has helped to support that work across the agencies by breaking down those silos and walls. That's great. Thank you. This is Capsonoma. They're also in the Community Action Partnership. This is their theory of change. I think that you know the key here is this is their ends. Where are they going? Why are they doing two gen? Economic stability, health and well-being, academic achievement, community engagement. And then their logic model would outline, you know, what what how do you measure that? How will they know? Um, different kinds of services and all towards a vibrant, resilient Sonoma County. Um, Metropolitan Action Commission in Nashville. Any, nobody's here from Metro Action. Anybody from Tennessee? So this is a public agency. What you have seen is a mix of public, private, uh, rural, and, and, and Metro. They have a, they just got $500,000 from the Kresge Foundation to fund their um, MAC for Jobs, which is a two-gen <coughs> program. Their folks in Head Start, their parents are getting um, IT training, and this CompTIA, which is some certification in computer, and then they do an internship with the city, and they're getting like $30 an hour when they get done with this. So they're breaking the cycle of poverty. It is an awesome uh, program. They do a lot of coaching. They are also about to publish a, uh, it's a, a, a little bit of a, a random control trial result um, that they have had an independent group look at. Um, so I'm really excited about them. They're awesome. They've done a lot of stuff to address their culture and uh, get focused on, on what they want for families. Um, so just real quickly, uh, in, in all those agencies that I mentioned and more, we've sort of been trying to f figure out what do agencies need to pay attention to to make this shift. So you need to be very clear about your design. You need to have a theory of change and a logic model and know where you're going and how you'll know when you get there. And then the other thing that you do, it need to do really is pay attention to these building blocks. So I already talked about engaging family voices, right? And gave you some examples of that. We've talked a lot about aligning quality intentional intensive services and integrating Understanding that systems and policy change is important. We've talked a little bit about that. Designing with an equity lens. And we haven't talked so much, but the culture, attending to your organizational culture is important. You can't just say to you know folks, coordinate and walk away and then expect to come back and you know everybody's practice is gonna change. You know, you gotta really look at your culture. Part of that is being clear about where you're going with everybody, and that's leadership. Funding, we haven't talked much about funding. That's certainly a 301, not a 101 conversation. But a lot of these examples, people are integrating, aligning existing programs like Head Start. You guys have worked with your state to figure out how to use some of your LIHEAP money um, to fund your coaches. Um, so there's a lot of different things going on, and people are being very creative. On the partnership website, if you Google whole family approach building blocks, a document comes up, a table with a description for each of these, and 10, 15 resources for each building block. And you're going to say to me, Jeannie, I can't read all that. So do, do, the, do something uh, fun. Get a group of people in your agency who are kind of interested in this. Make it cross-functional. Divide up those articles and resources and read them, and then come back together and download with each other. You know what was interesting. You know what did you see that would resonate for our agency, and start start a little learning group in your agency on this. Um, and those, if you can't find it, let me know. But it, but it's on there. And also on the partnership website, you will find this design plan. So if you're like 
I want to, I'm going all in on this. Um, uh, 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 Jerome's going to go home on Tuesday. He's going to tell, tell staff, we're going all, all in on this. Um, if you want to do that, there's a design plan on the Community Action Partnership that we created that help, will help walk you through thinking about your problem, thinking about the root cause, thinking about um, you know, how services are delivered, what your assumptions are, what your target families might be, um, your outcomes, your measures. Basically what this does is help you create a theory of change and a logic model. At the end of the, if you do all these steps at the end of that, you have a theory of change and a logic model. So you can look at this design plan and see if that's helpful for you. I already said to nerd out on all the Ascend um, resources, and there are, you know, there's an outcome bank, and there's a there's a document that's a 101, a 201, and a 301 that you can look at. Um, oh, I guess that's it. I thought I had another um, slide there, but. Um, in addition to um, the resources that I just mentioned, there is also on the partnership website, let me just get back here for a minute. Come on. Mm -hmm. Not that many slides in there, are Okay. On the partnership website, there are probably like 20 webinars that we've done over the last couple years on you know, deep dives into all the things that I've talked about today. So you could go on and, and look at, you know, pull some of those webinars down and listen to them. Um, that's, that's another resource. Uh, any questions or comments or anything else anybody wants to flag or have you had enough to Jen whole family for the morning? Yes. Re reminded to um, say you're going to post the presentation up yes. Tuesday. Yes, we will do that. I promise. Yes. Um, I think among, among other things, um, when you talk about community collaboration, is um, really engaging education and training for um, employers of entry level workers. And, you know, doing it respectfully and not preaching to them, but, you know, really um, showing them some different things that they can do from an HR standpoint, um, or even uh, re you know, benefit structure for those folks to set them up for success, yeah. and to understand the challenges of that workforce. Yeah. Um, so they do understand more why they make the changes they, they do and what the challenges yeah. are. Yeah. Because I think that if you have this well-level community approach, if you can help that entry into the workplace be smoother and more stable, um, this is for everybody. I agree. I think that's really smart. Anything else? All right, guys, safe travels. Right. Traveling mercies. Yeah.